school. And for about eight years, I was a member of the ACLS Committee of the National American Heart Association that wrote the guidelines for CPR and ACLS, including uh, the ones that I was working with, the 2005 edition of the guidelines. And uh, I, I worked my butt off for eight years, and I got one paragraph. <laughs> um, but I met a lot of people, and, and it, it was a cool experience in many ways, which I'll tell you. And as far as commercial, I do have a consulting business. I really only have one client, and the client is the Cook Group Companies, uh, a little old medical device, uh, a family of companies based in Indiana. Bill Cook uh, was a sponsor of the original Biomedical Engineering Center at Purdue. Uh, and we used to be the richest man in Indiana before he died. He started a lot of companies, uh, and many of our students work for Cook Companies. As far as I know, Cook is, has absolutely nothing to do with resuscitation. So in the classical sense, I should not have any conflicts of interest. All right, I do come from an engineering school. Uh, my office is right about there. Uh, and what we do in engineering schools is we solve problems and try to improve things and ask how can we make things better. Uh, a great word for engineering proposals is the word boost, or boost performance. We want to boost performance of this device, uh, or this technique, or this method. And so when I got started in my research career as a very young wizard, I got the idea that maybe standard CPR is not optimal. Or as my boss would have said, optimization by chance is unlikely. Why don't you do a more systematic study of resuscitation. And so that's what I set myself up to do as a young investigator. I was fortunate enough to get a research career development award from the NIH, which was a big deal because it pays your salary for five years, as long as you do 80% research. So we labored and labored, and I will eliminate talking about all the things that didn't work. Okay, we'll kind of tell you what we came up with was this notion of interposed abdominal compression CPR that Dr. Torres talked about, which is pressing alternately on the chest and the abdomen like that. And this is a picture that I think did appear in the ACLS manual. It was uh, started by our, 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 our artist in the Potter Building who drew the first version of this. And for artistic license, what he did was he put all the rescuers on one side so you could see their faces. In reality, it's much better for the person doing the abdominal compression to be on the opposite side of the chest, uh, of the patient, than the person doing the chest compression. So that's artistic license. But it's basically this interposed abdominal compression technique, what we call a 50% duty cycle. That's another term from engineering, duty cycle, percent on time. It means the percent of time on the chest versus off. So a 50-50 duty cycle is one in which you're compressing the chest half the time and the abdomen half the time. There are other po op options. There's one theoretical study that one of my students did and one animal study from Canada, uh, Alberta, that suggests that maybe a different ratio might be a little bit better, but for practical purposes, it's not that much better. So the 50-50 duty cycle is, is what almost everybody who's worked on this has used. Uh, <clears throat> what and I will explain a little bit later, we were talking about this earlier today, uh, that probably the best compression rate to do this is, uh, would be about 60 <coughs> complete cycles per minute. That is 60 per minute on the chest and 60 per minute on the admin, not 120 on the chest and 120 on the admin because it's almost physically impossible and comical. And also it doesn't work quite as well. And I'll show you some data about that. So I would recommend just an overall 60 cycles on the abdomen, uh, 60 cycles complete, <clears throat> 60 per minute on the chest and 60 per minute on the abdomen, alternating. What pressure do you use? In the early days, we used a folded blood pressure cuff on the abdomen between the hands uh, and the abdomen, and, and we, we measured the pressure pulses. Uh, and we found that about mm, 100 to 120 millimeters of mercury seemed to work about the best. Uh, if you overpressurize the abdomen, there is some risk of trauma, which has been over 
emphasized by some critics. Uh, but more, more importantly, you drain all the blood out of the vessels, the aorta and the vena cava. So once you, once you compress them 100%, you can't get any more blood out, right? So it's not necessary to do overpressurization. And you already know instinctively what the right pressure is, even if you don't measure it with a manometer, because it's the pressure required to palpate the aortic pulse. You can do a little theoretical analysis that says that if the external pressure on a vessel is about equal to, let's say, mean aortic pressure in this case, that means that half the time the pressure in the aorta is greater than the external pressure, so it's going to expand. And half the time the pressure in the aorta is less than the external pressure, so it's going to contract. Right? That means you get the best palpable pulse. And that's about what you want to do, you know, about 95 millimeters of mercury or so, mean aortic pressure for a normal person, transmitted from the chest wall to the abdomen. So it's very intuitive and very instinctive for physicians and nurses to get the right pressure. The existing guideline, and this is the last time I'm, I, I've checked, I tried to find the most recent guideline uh, from the Heart Association and ILCOR recommendations, and that is that IAC CPR for in-hospital recommend uh, resuscitation is recommended as an alternative or optional procedure that you can use. So Dr. Torres is within the guidelines um, whenever sufficient personnel are available. And in the days when we did this uh, uh, very formalized evidence evaluation system, I think they still have it. They have these different <coughs> classes of evidence that they say. And this was rated as a class 2B. And class 2B means that there's good evidence, but not overwhelming uh, evidence. Uh, my subcommittee suggested it should have been class 2A. And if it had been recognized as class 2A, that would have meant it had been standard of care, and the Heart Association would have taught it. And there would have been a national effort to teach this and build it into the curriculum. As it stands now, the official line is that it's, it's an optional alternative. Okay. Let me tell you a little bit of the story about how we discovered this. And I, when I say when we discovered this, I want to point out that there were about five different laboratories all over the world, including ours, including Omoto's in Japan, including the Techni uh, Technion Institute in Israel, at about the same time, it was in a five years, of people who just inadvertently stumbled upon this. Okay. It, wasn't a, it wasn't an act of intellectual brilliance on my part. What <laughs> happened was is that we ha I had a graduate student named Sandy Ralston. And Sandy Ralston was an interesting graduate student in that she was a registered nurse and a mother of teenagers. All right? I won't say how old, but a mother of teenagers. And she wanted to get a PhD in physiology. And she started studying the problem of intrapulmonary epinephrine for resuscitation. We did some animal studies. She got her PhD, and, she, and, and that paper has been cited quite a bit uh, subsequently. But the tradition that we had in those days was at the end of every standard experiment, if the animal were still alive, and this was done in anesthetized dogs as the animal model. If the animal were still alive and halfway stable, we'd do some kind of preliminary study at the end, uh, a pilot study at the end, with the notion that we would want to get the most information possible for every animal life sacrifice. That was our, our ethical standard. Um, nowadays, some, the, the animal studies committees might not let you do that because you're changing the protocol. And Sandy was interested in the idea of abdominal compression in CPR, in particular static abdominal binding, which had been published by uh, people in Johns Hopkins like Nisha Chandra and Myron Weisfeld as being uh, an, um, an adjunct to resuscitation. You can think of it as external aortic cross clamping. Okay, and you might be able to prove perfusion of the heart and the brain if you just cross clamp the abdomen. And so I said, well, why don't we try that? And, and Sandy said, well, I don't have an abdominal binding. And I said, well, that's okay. Just use your hand. Press on the abdomen. <clears throat> and she did. But because Sandy was a registered nurse, 
and understood anatomy. We were using a thumper at the time for Chet, a classical thumper with a piston that went up and down. Okay, she instantly recognized that when the thumper went down, the liver went south. Okay, and if she mashed on the liver, she was going to traumatize the liver. And so what she did is within seconds, she got into this rhythm of releasing pressure instead of holding static like that, which is what we were supposed to do. She instantly figured out and improvised online that it was much better to do this because it wouldn't traumatize the liver. And this is what happened to blood pressure. This is what happened to blood pressure right here. It immediately shot up like that. This is 100, this is zero millimeters of mercury calibrated. This is central venous pressure over here, which didn't go up nearly as much. And I looked at that, and I, that, that's the best blood pressure that animal had all day. And I looked at her, I said, Sandy, you've discovered a new form of CPR. You've discovered a new form of CPR. This is amazing. And here it's shown at low paper speed on the left and higher paper speed on the right. And you can see that there's actual area under this curve and there's a diastolic pressure here, which the ant didn't have before. That means that, means that there's blood perfusion. And so that's kind of how it got started. All right, and just to finish this story, I'm allowed to tell stories, maybe over 10 minutes, is that all right? Okay. Um, and, and that is, I said, all right, Sandy, Here's the deal. You could stop working on your thesis, and we could immediately do an, a quick 10-dog study and publish this. Or you could just keep working on your thesis and graduate on time. So you could either go for the degree as soon as possible, or you could go for the glory. And Sandy said, I'll think about it. And she came back in the next morning and said, I've decided to go for the glory. <laughs> And so we did a quick 10 dog study, and that was the first publication from North America on intercourse of dominant compression CCR. All right, now fast forward about 10 years. Uh, I got on the uh, Heart Association Committee and was asked to do a review of all of the evidence that had been published up to this time. And now we're talking about, oh, 1990. Uh, eight or nine, or around 2000, I think. I have it on, uh, yeah, 1998. They reviewed for the Heart Association. By that time, there were about over 30, 31 or 32 research papers reported on interposed abdominal compression CPR in different kinds of models. There were six models on computer studies, uh, computer models or mechanical models that you could build in a lab of the circulation try to mimic that. And of those, all six of them showed positive results in the sense of a significant improvement of pressures and flows in the system. There were 21 animal studies, and 20 out of those were positive. And what I mean by positive in this is that there were statistically significant differences between in positive differences between interposed abdominal compression CPR and standard CPR regardless of what measures of blood flow and hemodynamics they used, and regardless of the differences in what the standard level, standard CPR was like in different laboratories. And there were also 12 clinical studies, of which 10 had statistically significant positive differences. And this is what uh, we presented in our working group to uh, the American Heart Association in Dallas. And basically what they showed is that in adding interposed abdominal compressions to standard CPR will essentially double flow, blood flow, if you measure blood flow. Now maybe it's more like 50% in some cases, sometimes it's two and a half, but it's a little somewhere between a 50 and 100% improvement in blood flow. And, other in, and also in indirect measurements like diastolic pressure. We did experiments with oxygen uptake that I'll show you. Uh, Kevin Ward did experiments with CO2 excretion as a variable uh, to indicate the return of, of blood to the heart. Uh, and that's a, a, not a relatively non-invasive measurement. And there were also these clinical models, that's the, these are the first two, including a, a number of different uh, clinical scenarios, including pediatric overdose, drug overdose patient, acute hemodynamic studies, 
Uh, all arrests, mostly BF. And then uh, Jeff Sack did this study of extremely difficult arrests that were electromechanical dissociation or asystole. So there are a variety, it's been tested in a variety of different clinical models. Now, importantly, all of the studies that have been done have been with relatively small numbers, by which I mean uh, usually 100 patients or less in the total study. So the aggregate of all of these clinical studies, I think, was something like 426 patients when I presented it in the year 2000. Now there's a few more patients than that. So it's maybe up to you know 300 or so patients that have actually been studied and published in the literature at this point. Uh, I want to tell you about the best and I mean most famous study of interposed abdominal compression CPR in humans. And this was done by a fellow named Jeff Sack, who was a cardiology fellow in New Jersey and later moved to California where the beautiful people live. And uh, did another study out there, and then he moved to Florida and became uh, a private practice cardiologist, I think, still there. And Jeff Sack did this, did his research at a time when it was a lot easier to obtain informed consent than it is probably for you guys today. And that is, he was able to get informed consent from everybody who checked into his hospital. To be in a research, you know, they had this little half-page form that said, you know, if you happen to go into cardiac arrest, would you be willing to, you know, participate in this study? And most of the patients signed. So it was a truly randomized study of everybody who came into the hospital uh, during the time Jeff was doing the study. And what he found was, uh, to cut to the chase, is he got 29 to 48 or 60 percent of the people were resuscitated, we're talking about ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation, with IAC CPR versus 25% with standard CPR in a small randomized control trial. It was also measured survival to discharge. And it was 25% for the IAC versus 7% for standard CPR. He found no evidence of abdominal injury. This was back in 1992. If you look at all of the clinical studies that were done in human beings on IAC, uh, and I, except for the two new ones, which I'll show, tell you about in a minute, but this is still my summary from sort of the Heart Association, and that was there were four that were, and these are still, I think, are the only ones that are considered randomized control trials in which they actually randomize the patient to a different group as opposed to the five patient series. There were four of them. I want to point out, full disclosure, that the only one of these that I had anything to do with was the first one up here that showed no difference. Just so you know. But these other guys, like Ward and Sack, obtained significant differences. And the reason was is because, in my view, the reason was is because the first study by Matir was an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest study in, in uh, the Milwaukee, Wisconsin area. And they took all people that were brought in by EMS from around Milwaukee, including a lot of dead people that were impossible to resuscitate. Uh, so when Jeff Sachs started doing this for patients who were arrested in the hospital, um, he got a lot better results. And if you look at in-hospital resuscitation, you can see uh, if you look at return of spontaneous circulation as an endpoint, there's a 52 to 26 doubling of success. All right. It's kind of amazing that that kind of fits with the doubling of cardiac output. Now, I think that that is truly amazing. And the reason I think it's truly amazing is because it will be the other way around. There are so many things that happen in the post-resuscitation critical care. There are so many different kinds of patients with so much in different underlying pathologies that it would be easy for an even mildly cynical person to say, 
increasing blood flow for a period of four or five minutes during this very acute arrest situation is unlikely to affect long-term health. I mean, there's just so many other variables involved. <coughs> you're crazy, you're wasting your time. And yet it seems to be that maybe that blood flow during the resuscitation turns out to be a, a critical, a really critical factor because he, Jeff Sachs showed it predicts long-term survival. And survival to discharge, although the numbers are small, uh, also shows an obvious effect here, and I'll tell you, show you the statistics in a little bit. Yes, question. In those in hospital, does that mean like in the floor, in the ER? Or it means anywhere, it means not in community, not in the community, not brought in, in a, not brought to the hospital in a rest. I'm going to take time to tie my shoe here so I don't trip myself. Airport security, you know. All right. And if you do, and this is one that I personally did, if you do a meta-analysis of all of the data, even though the patient numbers are not like they would be in a drug study funded by a pharmaceutical company, um, you get an interesting result. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen this format before. This is got, you've seen a cumulative meta-analysis before you know what I'm talking about? Okay, the cumulative meta-analysis, what you do is you plot a, a measure of effect size, and in this case, it's the mean difference in proportion of survivors. So 0.3 would be 30%, 0.2 would be 30%, 20%. Um, you plot the effect size, IAC versus standard. If IAC is greater, percentage or fraction of survivors it's on the positive side here if standard has a greater fraction of survivors it's on the this side over here the negative side like that this first bar represents the very first study that was done that was the one that included out of hospital patients and then this is the sum of the first two aggregated these are 95 percent confidence limits this is the sum of all the first three, and this is the sum of all four studies. Got it, see how it works? That was invented up at Harvard. All right, they call it a cumulative meta-analysis. So you can see it evolved through time. And the dark triangles indicate ROSC as an endpoint, and the open circles represent discharge survival as an endpoint. And if you just look at those four studies, you can see that the trend goes like that. And if you believe that 0 0.05000 is a magical cutoff, <laughs> or if the 95.000 percent, then the, if you look at discharge survival, it just doesn't quite make it. <laughs> It's like P equals 0 0.0492 or something like that, okay. But it's very close to being statistically significant in that classical sense, uh, even for discharge survival, which is hard to get. And with ROSC, there's no question that, that better results happen. So this is, I, I was talking earlier about my mentor. This is L.A. Geddes, who was a distinguished professor of bioengineering at Purdue. Uh, founded the biomedical engineering program and later won the National uh, uh, Medal of Technology and Innovation. Um, and he would sometimes do some crazy things in the lab that the other people on the team would not really agree with. Um, and, and then he would present them at our meetings and, and people would make criticisms about, well, that doesn't quite make sense, or why didn't you do it this way? Or, and, and, and Dr. Geddes would get this little sheepish grin on his face and he'd say, well, gee, fellas, it works. <laughs> Maybe I didn't explain it right, but it worked. <laughs> Help me figure out how to make it better, okay? And so that's kind of my take here, and this was published in Resuscitation a few years ago. Uh, <coughs> If you look at the clinical data, IAC, CPR, in some reasonable sense, works. There have been some other subsequent studies uh, in the 21st century, for all of you modern folks. Um, and this includes uh, Dr. McClung, who was uh, uh, kind enough to give me a call and ask uh, what he should publish this, and I said, yeah. <laughs> and he published a case report 
Uh, and then here in the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine in 2015, that says a 79-year-old female with COPD, chronic renal failure, diabetes, and hypertension. Not exactly your easiest to resuscitate patient. And we had to witness cardiac arrest using pulseless electrical activity. She had nine minutes of standard CPR and no detectable pulses during CPR. So Dr. McClung started IAC at 100 per minute, plenty fast. And what happened was the PEA converted ventricular fibrillation. Uh, they were able to defibrillate and resuscitate the patient at 16 minutes. Um, so that was seven minutes of IAC CPR. And then she had subsequent stenting of the proximal LAD, uh, but she survived and lived and walked out of the hospital with no neurologic damage. And he thought that was sort of cool and worthy of comment. Uh, I also found uh, uh, this by Lee and Lee of work of cardiovascular surgeons. And they had patients who had a median sternotomy, so major heart surgery, and they were kind of, uh, and some of them would resuscitate, some of them would code after the, after the surgery. And they said, well, should we try to do chest compressions on these patients who just have their sternum wired together? Um, and they looked at the literature and they said, well, I'll tell you what, how about we compromise We'll do slightly, we'll do gentle chest compression, but we'll also compress the abdomen. And maybe for this selected group of patients, that would be better because they already read the literature that says inadequate chest compressions produces terrible results, which we showed with an animal study. We still cited a whole lot. Um, and there's new, there's new data from Saul Medical. Oh, I did consult with Saul Medical way in the past. And, and we did, I had a, a student named Andre Kemney. And Andre Kameny uh, set up an automatic data collection system for the Zoll medical devices and that would, would, would estimate the chest compression depth from, is that the, is that the Lucas, right? Okay, it estimates chest compression depth from the Lucas and then we could correlate that with their, with their outcome. And that also showed um, that there was a statistical difference between deeper chest compressions and not so deep in terms of survival, or at least conversion of BF, and we had a different uh, endpoints there. It wasn't the most definitive, but it, it, it fit with the animal data. Okay, so they got the idea that, well, we can't just be super gentle with these sternotomy patients. We have to do something, and they decided to try doing inner-post abdominal compression. They had better ROSC, better six-month survival, fewer injuries, and they concluded that this was a good artificial circulation technique for this special group of patients. And that was in, what did it say, 2014. Uh, as long as I'm here, I thought I, you might like to hear some highlights from our research at Purdue, some of the cooler things that we did uh, in our resuscitation uh, endeavors. And this is a, a, a diagram of the apparatus that was used by Bill Voorhees, William Delano Voorhees III, who was my postdoc uh, for several years, and uh, he, he was a great fiddler, an engineer, you know, and he loved to do inventive things. And what he did was he got out our 1935 vintage spirometer from the student lab, and he configured it so that it would work for positive pressure ventilation. Because Bill Voorhees didn't, he thought the ultimate test of any kind of artificial circulation system would be oxygen delivery to the periphery, right? He didn't, oh, blood pressure, well, that's indirect, you know. Well, cardiac, well, that's in, well, what if there's cardiac output and not ventilating it? What we really want to know is, is, is oxygen being delivered to the systemic tissues? So I'm going to measure that directly. And he hooked this up. And he took the spirometer, he had a CO2 absorber here, filled it with oxygen, and then he, he, he had a mechanical ventilator, he hooked this up, which is a bag that it could squeeze, some one-way valves here, and he could withdraw gas from the chamber of the bell of the bell spirometer, force it into the animal, 
We turn it here, filter out the CO2, and so the rate at which the oxygen was consumed would be reflected by the change in the volume inside the bell. Okay, so it could directly measure oxygen output. And here's what he found. These are some records that he made uh, that are graphic records in time. This is the oxygen uh, uptake record there, the level of oxygen in the bell. And, and pot, when it goes, because it goes opposite directions, up means oxygen is being used. Okay, this is this low pass filtered version, so it gets easier to take the slope. This is arterial blood pressure, classically measured. This is right ventricular pressure, and this is abdominal compression pressure measured with one of those blood pressure cuffs over the abdomen and hip flexure pressure cuffs. Here. So here's IAC over here. Here is standard CPR with and without the abdominal counter pulsation, and you can see there's a clear difference in the rate of oxygen uptake. And by the way, look at these blood pressures. 100. He got good blood pressures in his study. Here's 100 over here. We're talking about cardiac arrest and CPR with maybe as 100 millimeters of mercury mean arterial pressure. And if you look at the oxygen uptake data from Bill's study in aggregate, you can see here's standard CPR, there's IACPR in terms of mills of oxygen per kilogram per minute. So there's the same kind of delta that we talked about with cardiac output, uh, you know, a little bit less than two, uh, but in that ballpark. Uh, being in, in engineering school, even though I'm not personally trained as an engineer in undergraduate school, but having hung around with engineers for uh, 30, 40, whole year, 40 years, <laughs> I start to think like them. And I was intrigued in those days by the analogy between an electrical circuit and um, a, a circulation. Okay? The idea that you could build an electrical circuit in which uh, voltage was analogous to pressure, electric current flow was analogous to blood flow, capacitance was analogous to compliance, you could even include inertance, which is analogous to the inertia of blood flow in long vessels. And so we made this model and actually laid this out on a piece of wood with the capacitors representing the compliances of the vessels, uh, the resistors representing resistance elements. Um, and so what we had here was, uh, let me see if I get this right, the blood would come out. Here's, here's the superior vena cava, right atrium, right ventricle. We could pressurize any of these we wanted and then blood would flow through the lungs here into the aorta, back through the abdomen or the extremities or the head and neck. So this is the venous side over here, and this is the arterial side. We actually built this little circuit, which one of our technicians called the analog dog, because it rhymed, even though it was really an analog human. It was designed to be a human parameter. And, and cool thing about this model is we could do anything we wanted to it without destroying it. And after playing around with this model for a while, we discovered that there were really three mechanisms of blood flow during CPR. The first one we call the cardiac pump mechanism, which is illustrated here in its purest form. And that is what happens if the pressure is applied to the cardiac chambers only including both ventricles and both atria in this case. If you wanted to do an open chest CPR model, you could just apply pressure to just the ventricles and not even the atria, but we did it with all four chambers. And here's the example of the arterial pressure that we got simulated, and here's the superior vena cava pressure, and you can see there's a nice perfusion pressure difference. If you apply pressure to all of the chamber, large vessels in the thorax, including the cardiac chambers and the superior vena cava and the thoracic aorta and the pulmonary arterial and venous capacitances together, that also produces a positive pressure difference, but only during diastole. And the reason we did that is because the folks at Johns Hopkins at the time what we're advocating the uh, uh, idea that the heart is not compressed during CPR. 
that what happens is really there's a global rise in intrathoracic pressure, and the global rise in intrathoracic pressure is what drives blood. It's not a conventional heart is squeezed between the sternum and the spine, which is what Colin Owen, Jude, and Mickerbocker surmised when they published CPR in the very first experiment with uh, closed chest cardiac massage. In fact, they suggested that closed chest, chest cardiac massage was actually a misnomer. That was really the pressurization of the, all these structures in the thorax. And so this was our simulated cardiac pump mechanism. But then we also just applied pressure to the abdominal aorta and inferior vena cava. And we got forward flow in the electrical model. Not quite as much as the others, but I decided we should call that uh, abdominal pump mechanism because it was completely independent of the others. As shown in some subsequent circulation here, this shows the three mechanisms in their pure form, cardiac pump, thoracic pump, and abdominal pump. And the idea is that the abdomen can act as a separate pump to drive artificial circulation. Right? And if you want to think about, well, wait a minute, what's the mechanism? Well, you only need one valve. That's the aortic valve to work. Okay? You pressurize the, the, the entire aorta, which acts like one compliant. You pressurize the aorta, it squeezes blood into the periphery and not backwards because of the aortic valve. And then when you release, if there is a certain amount of elasticity to the aorta, in other words, it's not too atherosclerotic all over, Okay, it will release and that will draw forward flow through the aortic valve and refill it, and then you can squash it again. See how that would work? You can. So there is a separate abdominal pump. And if you can, then the cool thing about it is, unlike the thoracic pump, is you can combine the abdominal pump with either chest pump mechanism and boost, <laughs> boost performance. And this is the results that we got uh, in the electrical model. Uh, and you can see that thoracic pump plus IAC versus thoracic pump standard. Here's again is your 50 to 100% difference. And the bottom line is after many years of debate is probably the thoracic pump is the dominant pump mechanism in adults and the cardiac pump in mechanism is probably the dominant mechanism in children. And you can go back and forth on that. We can talk later if you want know about that. But we subsequently went on and showed uh, oh, I know I'm supposed to go. Sorry about that. We subsequently went on and showed that in this electrical model that, that there was a completely independent effect of the abdominal pumping, regardless of how you set up how effective the thoracic pump was. In other words, it added an independent boost, and you could write a formula like that to show on the top. Now, when I was in medical school, if anybody put a formula on the board, the student would hiss. So I'm, just, I'm glad that you didn't hiss. <laughs> All right. Now, okay, we were talking about abdominal, we were talking about using um, intraesophageal ultrasound. Okay, this is the best I can do. All right, I worked with a, a veterinary radiologist named Bill Blevins. And we decided to look and take images of an anesthetized dog with standard and IAC CPR. And we set up, we rotated the x-ray beam so she could shoot a cross table lateral. We put the animal on the x-ray table. We took cine angiograms, okay? And we did um, left ventriculograms during standard CPR and IAC CPR. So here we have a left ventricle, we had a pigtail catheter in the left ventricle. Then we put them in cardiac arrest and with ventricular fibrillation, electrically induced, and then did standard CPR. Here is the frame at four seconds after injection, and here is the frame at, what's it say, 13 seconds after injection. And you can see the blood hasn't left the ventricle. In fact, there's evidence of mitral regurgitation. 
If you took it with the same animal, we repeated this with interposed abdominal compression CPR. Here is the video frame at four seconds, and there is the video frame at 13 seconds. The dye is all washed out. As Paul Zoll, you're talking about Zoll? Zoll Medical? Paul Zoll, the founder of Zoll Medical, would say, any damn fool can see the difference. <laughs> He said that once at one of our conferences. By the way, do you want to hear a really good story about Paul Zoll? I got a chance to go see him. Uh, we, we, they had, used to have this resuscitation meeting at Key West, Florida. They called it the Wolf Creek series of meetings in Paul, at, at Jim Jude's house. Jim Jude was one of the original resuscitators. It's Cowan Open Jude and Knickerbocker. And he had a house in Key West. And we, back in those days when there were only about 20 people in the whole world that did resuscitation research, they all showed up at Key West, all right? And Paul Zoll was there and, and, and came along, um, and he brought the coolest girlfriend I've ever seen. All right, now this Paul Zoll, Paul Zoll was about 60, 70s at, the, at that time, a young puppy. And, and he had this marvelous, he brought a marvelous girlfriend with him who was a psychiatrist from Harvard. And she was the most charming lady I had met in, the, in, in, in science up to that point, with the possible exception of Janice Jones. Uh, and so Paul Zoll knew how to live and had a great time, uh, in addition to doing a lot of good work. All right. Well, let's start. A lot of people then ask, okay, well, you've talked about efficacy, you know, blood flow and oxygen delivery and stuff like that. Uh, what about safety? Well, this is a summary that uh, we did for the Heart Association. Yeah, there's the 426 humans, uh, different dogs and pigs. There's uh, all the animals and humans that have been studied with interposed abdominal compression CPR. There's only one pediatric case report that showed pancreatitis as a possible late complication of abdominal compression. So there's not a whole lot of evidence for abdominal injury. So question. Yes, sir. I, I guess this, well, you'll probably get to, into this in the, the uh, limitations, uh, limitations, but one thing I think about is in the potential trauma patient, where you're mm -hmm. an inter, you have an intra-abdominal bleed and you're trying to, what, how effective can this be? Uh, we, we, I, nobody has ever advocated it for for suspected abdominal so aortic aneurysm or so, intra-abdominal so, 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 No, I mean in the context of when you don't know. When somebody, oh. comes, in, uh, somebody comes in under cardiac arrest, they're bleeding from somewhere. You and you don't know where they're bleeding? Yeah. That's a good question. Well, and I don't, I don't know. I don't have a pat answer for it. What do you think? You do a quick foul, uh, yeah, ultrasound. Well, yeah. Yeah. You do a quick ultrasound. If you, uh, that's yeah, a, a, a fast study I think would be effective. But um, I do wonder. I, I do wonder. It then it's, it's just purely contraindicated in that section. Then you switch from. If if you have, if I would say certainly, if you have reason to suspect that there's abdominal trauma or abdominal aortic aneurysm, um, then do you exclude that patient? Okay. And then, sure. and is there any All the research studies, like SAC study, their protocol said. And if there's abdominal aortic aneurysm, we don't do it. That was an exclusion criterion for them. Okay, and um, any other any other sort of mechanical defects where you say like this this patient is uh, this patient is probably not a good uh, good candidate for a natural candidate for this type. Of thing? Yes, I'm coming to that. that there was a, a, a emergency medicine who was an emergency medicine resident when he did this, guys. Uh, it was Dr. Howard from Toledo, Ohio, which is my hometown, uh, and he did a study in which he suggested that there was decreased, using uh, blood pressure only as an endpoint, and he did a study that suggested that they didn't get good results in uh, um, overly obese patients. It was difficult to do in the, in the massively obese patients. Um, a couple of other there's limitations that um, might be important include in about, in, maybe 20% of animals, and if you look and use your imagination a little bit, maybe about in 20% of patients who had this technique applied, the central venous pressure goes up as much as 
the aortic pressure. That's not typical, but it can happen. In fact, there's even a few in which the central venous pressure goes up even higher, in which case the systemic perfusion pressure is not improved at all. Now, it's usually not made a whole lot worse than standard CPR, but it, there's a significant subpopulation in which the venous pressure rises more than the arterial pressure. And uh, I thought about trying to, and in fact, I wrote a paper about suggesting that moving more to the left, doing a, a left sided abdominal compression at maybe 13 degrees here by having the abdominal rescuer on the left. Uh, might improve that, but we never really uh, got convincing evidence that it was any better. And the mathematical models show that global abdominal pressure normally would produce better arterial pressure than venous pressure in terms of systemic perfusion pressure. And then there's also, and you're talking about right ventricular enlargement, oh, with the PE case this morning that there's also the possibility, and this is going to be interesting to look at with the uh, ultrasound study that you're, you were talking about, that if the chest compression is more effective at compressing the right ventricle than the left because of anatomic considerations, and if we prime the right ventricle with interposed abdominal compressions, it's possible to get relatively uh, large pulmonary artery pressures. And in one research animal I did up in Minnesota with Keith Lurie, um, we got frank pulmonary edema. I'm talking about pink frothy sputum coming out of the animal. Because what happened was is that the pulmonary pressures were so much higher than left ventricular pressure. Now that was after more than 10 minutes of CPR. You can argue that that's not that realistic. Charles, that was their point, right? Using the, the TV was to avoid this, the right ventricular compression? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or aortic roots. Want to aortic and, avoid and the aortic the roots or aortic roots. Aortic compression or atrial compression. compression. I don't know if they were really thinking about that. Right. Oh, I just flipped it. I apologize. Oh, the, uh, you know, that's, I, I talked about Bill Blevins' study when we did the cross table lateral. One of the things we found is that it's very easy to wind up compressing the aortic and pulmonary arteries, compressing the great vessels rather than the chest. Yes. Yes. Um, and that's totally ineffective. It's totally ineffective. And it's only just a few centimeters different. Yeah. 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 It's, it's easy, it's easy to miss. Um, in fact, and then you start getting down close to the liver and you worry about liver tunnel. So it, there's, a, there's a definite sweet spot, which may also explain some of the variability in the resuscitation studies, and that, but it's unappreciated by most people. Okay. All right. So what are some of the knocks against IAC CPR? This was brought up by uh, uh, some of our committee members. One of them was that IAC is too complicated. And uh, I think that that's basically not true, but in order to do that, I did an analysis here of the complexity in terms of the number of steps that the rescuer has to do uh, multiplied by the number of decisions they have to make. And then for IAC, there's only four steps times decisions. If you do something like the recovery position, you guys still have that? Putting the patient in the recovery position, that used to be in the guidelines. Dealing with choking, I'm like maneuver, and using an AAD, there's a lot more complexity to that. So I, I, I doubt that that was an important issue. Uh, uh, concern number two is, it kind of goes along with that, is that there's been a trend to, well, if you know with um, um, no ventilation CPR, hands-only CPR courses you can take now to try to simplify, at least for basic, for, for lay rescuers, to simplify the resuscitation process. And, and, and if you say to a decision-making body, well, we want you to add this extra adjunct um, that's making it more complicated, so it kind of goes against the wind of, of the movement to simplify resuscitation. Um, I think that what we tried to do in the original guideline recommendation 
was that to limit this to healthcare professionals. We're not saying lay rescuers should necessarily, everybody should go out there and do that because the evidence is only for the in-hospital resuscitation. And then this is another one. Now this, I did present a similar, not as good as this one, I guess, but a similar grand rounds in Cleveland at the Cleveland Clinic a few years ago. And there were, there were emergency medicine residents there. Um, um, probably not as smart as you guys are. <laughs> Uh, but they were really a keen observers. And I showed this, this figure from Jeff Sachs' original paper. I told you the Jeff Sachs. And they looked at that and they said, oh my gosh, this study is totally bogus. The numbers don't add up. And here's, this is Jeff Sachs, 14 died over here, 41 died in this group, all right? Uh, and here's 29 and so on. And they said 14 plus 29 equals 43, not 48, which you said in the, in the other parts of the paper that were entered the study. You haven't counted some of the patients. Therefore, we're not gonna believe anything you have to say from now on. However, <clears throat> after, <laughs> After a few hours, I found the missing patients. The missing patients were in the IAC group that died, all right? Which means they have no effect on the overall percent survival data. This was a typographical error by Jeff Sachs. Now, remember back in those days, they had these things called pencils? <laughs> you know, and the, and the cardiovascular fellows would actually, they would actually write a manuscript and probably handed it to the secretary and the secretary thought this four, uh, was it the nine was a four and put the four up there. But in, 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 but in more than one occasion, Jeff Sachs' study has been crucified because of that mistake right there. But it doesn't make any difference on the actual uh, outcome of the study. And some of the greatest, uh, most critical investigators in resuscitation have, have reviewed his study and found nothing wrong with it. But I point that out as one of the reasons why uh, maybe it hasn't been adopted. Okay, uh, I kind of talked about that already, so I'm going to go ahead. I do want to say something about the compression rate, because there is no, um, and they probably never will be, a definitive clinical study that says what is the optimal compression rate for interposed abdominal compression CPR. And the reason is, we use some mathematical models like that, uh, that, and what we found was that if you look at, in terms of model results, in this case using systemic perfusion pressure as a measure, a figure of merit, versus compression frequency in cycles per minute here on the horizontal axis, that if you look at IAC, it's almost completely flat. In fact, there might even be a little tendency for the perfusion pressure to go down if you increase the rate above one per second or 60 per minute. Whereas with standard CPR, there's a curve like this. Now notice there's not a heck of a lot of difference between 60 and 100, and that's another thing we can talk about later. <laughs> People make a big deal about rate, but there's no evidence out there that the rate makes a very much difference at all. <laughs> but it's easy to specify, you know, teach, and then they have the songs, and Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's why I'm saying that I would personally recommend a middle rate. You don't have to overdo it if you're going to compress it both the chest and the head. But doing a clinical study to detect a difference like that, it would take 3,000 patients. I mean, it would never happen. Okay. Oh, I did that again. All right. Uh, a little advice if you're going to get into this, um, I would suggest avoiding the failed ACLS model, uh, a McClung study notwithstanding. All right, you cannot resuscitate dead people who are, or as let's see, um, uh, one of my colleagues used to say, truly most sincerely dead. He wasn't merely. This is uh, from from um, the Christmas Carol. He wasn't, the Morleys were not, were surely dead, and truly most sincerely dead. <laughs> it cannot be resuscitated. 
uh, because all that does is it, is, is it adds a bunch of those patients to both the experimental and the, and the control group, and it means you have to have much higher ends to detect any significant difference. So that's one of the reasons why the in-hospital environment works better, because you don't have people in Brian in a rest for 30 or 40 minutes. Especially in a, well, oh, especially in rural environments and in urban environments like New York City, where the EMTs have to go up the elevators in the tall buildings to come back down, delays time from arrest to hospital admission. Those are the two environments where the wait times are great. Okay, so you might mm -hmm. ask at this point, because some people have, well, if this is so good, why isn't that, why hasn't there been a bandwidth for it? Uh, what, there must be something wrong. It must be morally corrupt. Oh boy! Or as they say in the Midwest, if you're so smart, why ain't you rich? <laughs> All right. And I personally agonize with this, and I don't know if I have a right, but I'll give you some speculation. One of them is that this is a relatively low-profile orphan procedure. All of the people who worked on it, including myself, and I probably worked on it more than anyone else on the planet, were actually specialists in some other intellectual discipline. It was a side discovery by people who, who are not in emergency or trauma medicine. And therefore, they kind of said, you know, here it is, they published it, and they went on to do something else. Also, there's no device, no company, and no big money behind it. Now, when I was a young wizard, I actually thought that this was good. I thought, isn't it amazing that it doesn't, you don't have to buy anything, that you can do this with your hands, you know, that ought to make it easy to you know, transition into clinical practice. But maybe that wasn't right, because a lot of medical technologies that get developed, get developed because somebody's going to make a buck off. And therefore, there's a company in which people come to work every day and work on that for a living and put in all of the effort it takes to go from a bench to a bedside, which you've probably heard those bench to bedside talks. All right. And as my old friend Cliff Alpernes, who's an entrepreneur and physiologist from Seattle, Washington, said, it's only 10% science. There's so many other issues in getting any new technique adopted, whether it be politics, whether it be funding, whether it be marketing, whether it be the FDA, you know, all of those things. He said that when it comes to innovation in the medical device space, I only spend 10% of my time on science. Uh, and that's on a good day. On a bad day, it's 5%. So this was really discovered as a side project by different people. And Nevertheless, what happened was at the Heart Association, our subcommittee originally made the wording for the, uh, the ACLS provider manual as shown here. This was the original wording from, from February, I'm sorry, May 2000. And that is it's acceptable alternative to standard CPR and for in-hospital resuscitations, IAC is the treatment of choice. That was our word, when possible. And in subsequent iterations, that was deleted by people who weren't as familiar with the real data as the people in the subject. No hard feelings there. Either. OK. And in fact, I went on to think about this. I don't, you probably all hate statistics. You hate statistics. Are you, some. Are you, oh, are you required to know, have statistics? Some. Some. Some? Okay. All right. Well, I want you to think about, you know about, do you know the difference between type 1 and type 2 statistical error? This is a big deal. All right. Your sweet spot. Oh, boy. Okay. All right. Type 1 error is making a... Let me make sure I get this right, because you always have to work, okay? It's making 
a false positive claim about a new method based on the research, a false positive interpretation of the research, to say there's an effect there that was really due to random variation. But, and that's the one we all focus on, right? P equals 0.05, P less than 0.05. All the, most of the courses, including one my daughter is taking now in graduate school, she asks me questions about it all the time now. Um, can we avoid making a false positive recommendation? But there's another kind of statistical error, which is making a false negative evidence evaluation. In other words, concluding that the null hypothesis is true when it's, there's actually a true effect. And what I did after my experience working on these guidelines was I did a mathematical model of the heart association. <laughs> and, and the evidence evaluation process. And went through some scenarios looking for type 1 and type 2 errors. And I discovered a lot of things that were literally horrifying to me. Okay. And that is that the way these committees, so you have a bunch of guys, and most in those days, there were very, not very many women actually, a bunch of guys sitting around the table and debating about should we recommend this or should we recommend that. And in fact, the way the guidelines process actually worked used what the statisticians now call, people who have studied this call, the vote counting method, all right? In which what you do is you weigh the evidence, all right? And you take all of the studies that show statistically significant results, no type one error, right? Statistically, you put them in a pile. And then you take all of the studies that don't show significant results and you put them in a pile and you see which pile is heavier. And just to be safe, you want the statistically significant pile to be bigger, like at least twice as big as the other pile. All right. That's called the vote counting method. You use each study and count it as a vote. And it turns out that that is a logically flawed approach. In that, first of all, people talk about negative studies. And a negative study in that parlance is one that does not have a statistically significant difference. In other words, it shows no difference between the experimental group and the control group. They call that negative. All right, which means they count it psychologically as minus one instead of zero. And as a result of that process, you can show that there is a very large type two error when you use the vote counting method. And that's why the vote counting method has been um, replaced, and I, I hope they're doing it now, by a proper meta-analysis because a meta-analysis doesn't have that inherent bias. Uh, now, if you want, I can just I'll zip over here to my summary. And if you want to talk about more, I, I can show you some amazing things. Well, you don't want one amazing thing. Well, no, I don't want to show you amazing things. With the new mechanical devices, I, I see it like if I could just tune down the rate from 100 to like 60, yeah. I could easily see myself putting the machine on uh -huh. and just having a, an abdominal thumper. Yes, abdominal thumper. A person doing it or... A person doing it. That's the way we did it in the lab all the time. If you could get, if you could get a, a, like a Lucas and program it to do 60 per minute, then you could have another person do that. Less manpower. Less manpower. In fact, another, there was a reason, remember I talked about that first study by Mateer in Wisconsin? Mm -hmm. Okay, there was another flaw with that study. And that was that they did it in ambulances and they had two man ambulance crews. Or solo. And so what happened was that during transport, they didn't get IAC. So it was actually a study of IAC some of the time versus standard CPR. 
rather than a study of IAC CPR continuous versus standard CPR continuous. Well, plus you didn't make them heroic. Right. That one person could have done both. Well, okay. Now that is another thing. Not many people can do that. Not many people can do that. But there is um, Wan Chung Tang as director of the Institute for Critical Care Medicine in uh, Southern California out in the desert. And he developed a thing called the Life Stick. Has anybody heard of that? Mm -hmm. The Life Stick. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Oh, it's, it's, it's like a... Well, I'll draw it on the back. Mm -hmm. All right. The Life Stick. What? See, this is what happens when people don't put the cap on the All right. The Life Stick looks like this. It has two plungers, a chest and abdominal plunger. It has two handles, and one guy with broad shoulders, as they say in politics, could do like this with the life stick and press on the chest and the abdomen together. And he patented that and did some animal studies that showed that it was effective, but that the problem was he tried to license it to a company in England and they had all kinds of legal and patent problems. It's only 10% science. And the life stick died. So there is a way of doing this with one person if you have one of those. Or, or you improvise your own life stick. All right. Well, here's my summary then. Uh, Interposed abdominal compression can in increase blood flow by a, a factor of about two. There's lots of research that indicates that that's correct. Um, it benefits hemodynamics in humans, as shown by blood pressure and oxygen excretion, and CO2 excretion. And for in-hospital arrest, it basically doubles survival. Oh, I, I, I saw a statistic. Are you guys into the number needed to treat? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. The NNT for, for this, in terms of producing ROC, ROSC, is 3.9 patients. That means you have to treat four patients with this to save one life. Now, in the world of NNT statistics, anything under 10 is considered really good. And this is a very simple, you can calculate this number from this. Very simple for me. It doesn't take a mental judgment. All right? As yet, no effect improvement of this in a free hospital setting has been demonstrated. I'm having all kinds of time, trouble. Some people can, you know what they say in technology school? Some people can push a button and some people can't. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, there's improved hospital discharge. And if you add up all the data, P is slightly less than 0.05. For those of you who like that, that's a benchmark number. And that's the end of my talk on Interposed abdominal compression CPR. I'll be I'll be happy to hang around and, and take sling arrows. What's your uh, what's your idea your impression on uh, uh, rescue pod versus your method? Do you ever do a head to head of standard CPR with that device on the ET tube? Yes. Versus doing your uh, yes intra abdominal. In fact, yes, the rescue pod is a device that was invented by. Uh, a friend of mine, Keith Lurie, up in Minnesota, who discovered, and what he discovered is the very importance of negative intrathoracic pressure to create filling during resuscitation. Did it? Did you know how he discovered it? No. Okay, Keith Lurie is a cardiologist in Minnesota, and he had a patient who was a who was a plumber, and the plumber's partner saw him go into cardiac arrest fall down on the job, and he literally took out, this is a true story, a plumber's plunger. And he put it on the guy's chest, he stripped off the clothing, he put it on the guy's chest, and he started doing like this. All right, with a plumber's plunger, and the patient lived. And he told this story to Keith Lurie, somewhat sheepishly, and Keith Lurie said, you know, he had one of those aha moments, he said, oh my God, this is, this must be really important, you're creating negative intrathoracic pressure. And so with that rescue pod device, and then he went on, Keith Lurie went on to found a couple of different companies that morphed into 
Yeah, he's another one of these reasons why in the Heart Association they always talk about conflict of interest because he, he really had a conflict of interest because he started a company to make rescue funds. <coughs> Although he did find science, there's nothing wrong with that. But anyhow, uh, he came up with a rescue pod and has promoted it somewhat uh, su successfully. If you look on the meta-analysis that I showed you, and I think I put the citation on the slide, um, in that same paper, there's a similar meta-analysis for the rescue pod in the version that existed at that time. Okay. And what happened is with the rescue pod, there was a smaller effect on immediate resuscitation success, which tended to get worse with the number of studies. Remember, th this is a thing about the cumulative meta-analysis that the proponents of it suggest is a good deal. And that is, if it's, it's a real effect, the, as you accumulate the data, the, 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 the data points should get farther away from the decision line. With the rescue pod, as you accumulate the data, they get closer to the decision line. That is to say, it gets worse the more research you do. Oh, okay. Instead of getting better the more research you do. Um, and it doesn't have the effect on, on survival that IAC has. Right. Um, nevertheless, it's a good... Oh, okay. All right. You can combine them. All right. Now, I had an extra talk prepared in case there were emergency medicine residents. Do you guys have to do a research requirement for your residency? Yes, all of them do. Okay. Mandated. If there's anybody who wants to hang around or after a little break, I have a you know, kind of so a talk related to doing a research projects for emergency medicine residents. But let me cut to the chase and show you how you can combine those things. And I think it's on this same slide. And this is something we studied in, in mathematical models. And, and it's called, that's okay, Here's, here is life stick. the life stick, right? Okay. And what we did is we at least theoretically explored the possibility of combining the interposed abdominal compression CPR with uh, the Keith Flurry technique of negative intrathoracic pressure like the rescue pod. And then what we did is we, did, we have a life stick with sticky pads. So you can go like this, see? And you can both compress and decompress the chest and the abdomen all together. All right? That's called, anyway, I call that four-phase CPR, compression and decompression of the chest and the abdomen, four. All right? And we can simulate this using computer models. And we could, for example, and we found out that with the Keith Lurie method, you can't get very much more than about 30 millimeters of mercury negative pressure in the, in the thorax with, you know, even with the best uh, technique. So we, we had, these are the negative pressures in the chest and the abdomen. This is the positive pressures in the chest and the abdomen. The reason this is lower than that is because of the intervening ribs. So this is the pressure that's actually on the outside of the heart, and this is the pressure that's actually on the outside of the abdominal aorta. Okay, but you can do this in principle. And what happened is, uh, let me show you, uh, let me just cut to the chase here, whoops. Four phase CPR, here we have in the triangles, let me get this right, this is aortic pressure with four phase CPR with a thoracic pump mechanism and we get a simulated three liters per minute cardiac output. It's the best of any technique. This is a human dog or swine? Say that one more time. Please. Is it a dog, a pig, or this a human? This is an electronic model. Oh, okay. This is a, this, so this is a mathematical model, uh, not a dog or a pig. Uh, and we haven't actually done this. On, I haven't actually done this because I wound up doing going in other directions in my research. Um, but what here is, this is the thoracic pump factor, which is the percent of blood that's moved by the thoracic pump versus the cardiac pump. And if you you can see that. For a cardiac pump mechanism, is the most effective compared to th thoracic pump, which we had before. And here is 
standard CPR, uh, um, active compression decompression, which was the CPR, which was what Lori did before the rescue pump to try to get negative intrathoracic pressure. And then here is four phase up here. And if you look at mean systemic perfusion pressure, you can get in the range of you know, 60 to 90 versus on a good day with a tailwind, 20 to 50 systemic perfusion pressure. So yeah, I think you can't, you could combine those techniques. And that's an open question. You, I mean, if you invented yourself some sticky pads, uh, you, you could do it. You could do it here. Be the first to do it. Or suction cups, or or suction cups, or something like that. Um, but theoretically, it should work. But I don't know if anybody who's I've done it in a real, either an animal or human model. Right. So if you re you really want to have a, an ambitious research project as a resident, <laughs> well, you could just do you have any kind of animal research facilities on? Not on the premises. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it could leave me like Bill Cook and jump right to the human model. If you got somebody who had an art line, you know, and you could get some kind of hemodynamic data, you could also you could also monitor your own ICAC versus standard, you know, and 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 and, and get some results. Or um, you could even try the four phase. If you could if you could improvise a way to do four phase in principle in some of these models i didn't show the best one here but you can get almost five liters per minute cardiac output if you tune everything up i've done it solo when people don't understand what i'm doing <laughs> <laughs> that's on a lot of things though <laughs> <laughs> No, but then I learned I had two students. I had two students once, and I had to tell them and cue them, like, you press, she lets go. And we just, it, it got done. We got tired that day. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Babs. I'm sorry I'm going to post it up. <laughs>